Let's look at an example of inference for a variance. We'll use methods based on the assumption of a normally distributed population. The example I use in this video involves weights of cereal. The data is real data I've collected, but I've changed the story a little bit in order to make a few points a little more clear. Suppose you supervise a production process that produces 368 gram bags of cereal. 368 grams is the stated weight on the package. You have a new boss and they are very concerned that there is too much variability in the weight of the bags. Ideally, they'd like there to be no variability and have 368 grams of cereal put into each bag. But that's not practical to achieve, and there's going to be some variability. But since consumers don't like getting less than what they've paid for, producers have to put in more product into a package on average than what they state, in order to make sure that almost everyone is getting at least what they paid for. So high variance can cost producers money, because they have to put more product into the packages. Your boss wants you to reduce the variability, and to show strong evidence that the standard deviation of the weights is less than 5 grams. Your boss thinks that a standard deviation of less than 5 grams is acceptable. You make changes to the filling process that are designed to reduce the variability. You then draw a random sample of 15 bags from a large lot and find that the sample standard deviation is 2.83 grams. So the sample standard deviation is quite a bit less than 5 grams, the upper bound your boss gave you. Based on this value, we have a little evidence that the true standard deviation is less than 5 grams. But as is always the case in statistics, there is some uncertainty associated with our estimate. Does this data give strong evidence that the true standard deviation is less than 5 grams? Here we will construct a confidence interval for sigma squared, the population variance. And from there it will be pretty easy to get a confidence interval for sigma, the population standard deviation. And our boss wanted us to show strong evidence that the standard deviation is less than 5. Since we are looking to show there is strong evidence that the standard deviation is less than 5, we will make that our alternative hypothesis in the hypothesis test. The null will be that this is not the case, and sigma equals 5 grams. We could, equivalently, write these hypotheses in terms of the variance, and make the null hypothesis that the population variance is 25, and the alternative hypothesis that the population variance is less than 25. The procedures we are about to use assume that we are sampling from a normally distributed population. These inference procedures for variances can work very poorly if the normality assumption is violated. They are not at all robust to violations of the normality assumption. The normality assumption is very important here, so let's see what a normal quantile-quantile plot of the data values looks like. Here's a normal quantile-quantile plot of the 15 weights. Recall that in normal quantile-quantile plots, if the points fall close to a straight line, then the data values are approximately normally distributed. Here, most of the points lie very close to a straight line, but there are two points in the right tail that fall a little above the line. They are a little bigger than what we'd expect to see if we were sampling from a normally distributed population. But they are not extremely large. We might call them mild outliers or slight outliers. Some sources have a technical definition for the term mild outlier, but I'm using that term in a loose sense here. Is it still valid to use procedures based on a normally distributed population? Well, the sample variance is quite sensitive to extreme values, and it's always a little sketchy to use these inference procedures for variances, as they rely so heavily on the normality assumption. But we're not ever going to get a perfect normal quantile-quantile plot, even if we're sampling from a normally distributed population. I don't think this plot is too bad, so I'd say yes, it's okay to use these procedures, if we bear in mind that it's always a little bit dubious, and we shouldn't put too much faith in the results of these procedures. Here's the formula for a confidence interval for the population variance when we are sampling from a normally distributed population. And we want a 95% confidence interval, so alpha is 0.05, and alpha over 2 is 0.025. We end up with this. We get this chi-squared 0.025 value and this chi-squared 0.975 value from the chi-square distribution. We had a sample size of 15, so we have 14 degrees of freedom. And I'm plotting in here 
a chi-square distribution with 14 degrees of freedom. We want a 95% confidence interval, so we put 95% of the area into the middle, and we split up the remaining area of 5% evenly into the two tails, 0.025 in the right tail and 0.025 in the left tail. Chi-square 0.025 is the chi-square value that has an area to the right of 0.025. That's going to be right here in the right tail. And chi-square 0.975 is the value that has an area to the right of 0.975, and therefore an area to the left of 0.025, and that's going to be here in the left tail. We can find these values using software or a chi-square table. I have videos on how to do that if you have trouble finding those. If we go to software or a table, we can find that the value with an area to the right of 0.025 is 26.119, and the value with an area to the left of 0.025 is 5.629. I'm giving these values to three decimal places, but you should use as many decimal places as possible throughout the calculations. And then we'll substitute these values into the formula. We end up with this. And if we substitute in the sample size of 15 and the standard deviation of 2.83 and carry out the calculations, we end up with this interval. This is an interval for sigma squared, so we can be 95% confident that the population variance sigma squared lies within this interval. It's often a little more intuitive to express this in terms of the standard deviation, which is just the square root of the variance. If this is a 95% confidence interval for sigma squared, then it stands to reason that a 95% confidence interval for sigma would result from taking the square roots of those two endpoints. This works out to 2.07 to 4.46. So we can be 95% confident that sigma, the population standard deviation, lies between 2.07 grams and 4.46 grams. Sigma represents the standard deviation of the weights of all bags of cereal in the large lot of bags from which we drew our sample. Recall that our boss wanted us to show strong evidence that the standard deviation is less than 5. Note here that the entire interval lies to the left of 5, so based on this interval we have pretty strong evidence that the true standard deviation is indeed less than 5. But since that's our point of interest, showing strong evidence that the standard deviation is less than 5, we can carry out a more formal hypothesis test. Here's the sample standard deviation and sample size once again. And we are going to test the null hypothesis that the population standard deviation is 5 against the alternative hypothesis that it is less than 5. If we are able to reject the null hypothesis in favor of this alternative hypothesis, that would mean that we have strong evidence that the population standard deviation is less than 5, as our boss wants. The appropriate chi-square test statistic is this quantity. If the null hypothesis is true, and the normality assumption is true, this test statistic has a chi-square distribution with n-1 degrees of freedom. The observed value of the test statistic is 15 minus 1 times the sample variance of 2.83 squared over the hypothesized variance, which is 5 squared. To three decimal places, this works out to 4.485. Now we're going to get the p-value from the chi-square distribution. Here are the hypotheses and the observed value of the chi-square test statistic. I'm going to draw in the chi-square distribution with 14 degrees of freedom here. And the observed value of the test statistic, 4.485, falls right here on this distribution. With this alternative hypothesis, that sigma is less than 5, values far out in the left tail give evidence against the null hypothesis and in favor of the alternative. The p-value is the probability, under the null hypothesis, of getting this observed value of the test statistic or something farther to the left. So for this alternative hypothesis, the p-value is the area under this curve to the left of 4.485. Using software, we can find that this area is 0 0.0082, so that's the p-value. 
0.0082. If we didn't have access to software and we had to use a chi-square table, we couldn't find an exact value, but we could say that the p-value lies in an interval, between 0.005 and 0.01, for example. This is a small p-value, giving strong evidence against the null hypothesis and in favor of this alternative hypothesis. The evidence against the null hypothesis would be considered statistically significant at some of the usual significance levels, like 0.05 or even 0.01. So there is very strong evidence that the true standard deviation is in fact less than 5. But what does that mean in the context of this problem? It means there is very strong evidence, based on this small p-value of approximately 0.008, that the standard deviation of the weights of cereal in all bags of the lot from which we sampled is less than 5 grams. So we have some pretty strong evidence to show our boss that we've satisfied their demand, and that the standard deviation is in fact less than 5. We could also report the 95% confidence interval, showing our boss the range of plausible values for the standard deviation. Note that for this example, there are many factors that might affect the variability. For example, things like having different operators, different machines or wear and tear on one machine, different raw materials, even things like changing temperature and humidity levels. If these factors are changing through time, that could very easily increase the overall variability. Looking at the variance for a single lot might not tell the whole story. In scenarios like the serial example, the process should be carefully monitored through time, as quantities like the mean and variance may very well change through time. As with any statistical estimation, properly estimating the true variance can be a little tricky at times.